Welcome everyone to Shanky University. I am very excited to be introducing my dear friend and an amazing acupuncturist, Jeffrey Dan, to another edition in the Japanese acupuncture series that we've had on this on this channel. If you're new to this channel, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the little bell. It will notify you when I put out new videos all about Japanese acupuncture, mock question, and so 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 much more. But but now I'd like to get straight into the conversation with Jeffrey. So Jeffrey, please, if you wouldn't mind, give everyone a brief introduction of your very long history and where you're at in the world right now. Well, thank you, Maya, for this opportunity. Very long history. I guess Vernon Eddy makes it very long. I started out as an anthropologist, and I think the, the major transition in my personal life going to the University of Washington, and I was in a large NIMH grant studying Native American alcoholism. And first, I lived in a, a reservation, or they don't have reservations in their in a Native community in British Columbia, because my task was to see who are the models and how do adolescents learn to drink? What's the anthropology of alcohol? in rural Native communities, and I did that for almost a year. And then the other fellow on the project, his job was to see what happens to Native drinking patterns in urban environments. And he couldn't handle the amount of participant observation drinking that he had to do. So he dropped out, and they transferred me back to Seattle's First Avenue, Pike Street Market area, and where it was a completely different world. There are so many tribal affiliations of Northwest Coast, of Plains Indians, or California groups, that every group had their own tavern, that they would have their hangouts. Anyway, I have been doing this research, which was very schizophrenic. I lived about three days and nights in flop houses and on Skid Road. And no one knew who I was, I posed. I think it would be very unethical by today's anthropological standards. I was 25, 24. I posed as a, a young migrant fruit picker. And only one policeman and one bartender on the strip knew who I was and what I was doing. And then I spend the rest of the week in a university in a background. It's day and night. It was very crazy. But at that time, I started uh, studying Chendo, Japanese art of fencing. And I was coming to the conclusion that as an anthropologist, I was studying the wrong people. We should be studying the indigenous people who did not become alcoholic mm -hmm. rather than the ones who did. Where, where were they getting their resilience, their capacity to deal with all? the cultural stresses. And I realized, oh my goodness, here in Japanese martial arts was a built-in idea of vitality and resilience that could be cultivated. I said, well, this is way more interesting to me personally. And I, I want to study how they do this so I can use this in some other way. And then I decided I would, after I finished that research on Native alcoholism and uh, tavern behaviors as a master's degree. And I said, okay, for a doctorate, I want to start studying Japanese and uh, go to Japan. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that at that time I was a first degree black belt in, in Kendo and was a member of the Hawaii Kendo team for an international tournament in, in Los Angeles. I think this is 1971. And uh, there was an, a teacher who really sparked my interest. There's something about his person, his, uh, how his body moved. And uh, I went and spoke with him. He didn't speak English, and my Japanese was just getting started. And it turned out he was a body worker, among other things. And she came and then treated the entire Hawaii kendo team. And the treatment was unlike anything I'd ever had. And I said, he said, well, come and visit me when you come to Japan. So through him, I had these wonderful connections. He practiced what was called uh, uh, 
Bay Thai Hall, which was had a lot of aspects of most people are familiar with Shiatsu, mm-hmm. and some people are familiar with Am. Um, it, it had those, but it had a much more structural point of view. And so then when I was getting ready to go to Japan, the personal story, the week before I was supposed to, there was a boat going from Honolulu to Yokohama, a Japanese shipping company had bought an American passenger ship. So I was at a goodbye party and dancing with a young lady who was a really professional dancer and I was trying to keep up with her. And all of a sudden, I'm on the floor. My knee was dislocated. This was like on a Saturday. And uh, so on Monday, I go into a chiropractor that I had been, and he said, no, I think you got a tour of meniscus. You better go see your orthopedist. So I did get an interview with the orthopedist to briefly check me out and said, yeah, I think it's a meniscus. I, I can clean you up next week. I said, no, I'm leaving for Japan for three years next Saturday. <laughs> Goodbye. So every time in Japan, when I would sit cross-legged, I lived in, of course, a tatami-based apartment that had no chairs, no couch. I was in the dojo every day. And every time I'd cross-legged, my knee would dislocate. I had a little back. And it was was hard. And so the school said, well, why don't you go see this tradition? A doctor, he's helped a lot of our foreign students. So I went and this up, Hamijo Sensei, and I was living in Kyoto at the time. He was a, a Tenrikyo priest. Tenrikyo is a, yeah, a variant of modern form of Shinto developed in the last century. And uh, he checked me out. He had a, a little group of foreigners. We were a little coterie. He was an amazing guy. We have, Borgman became acupuncturist after. But he didn't do acupuncture. But he said to me after he checked me out, he said, You know, the problem is your koshi is twisted and your hamstrings are really tight. So the problem's not in your knee. The knee is the end result of a line of tension that's happening from your lumbar pelvic center. Koshi, oh, it's a word I've never heard. <laughs> Oh. Our concept of koshi, which is a mind body entity which doesn't exist in the English language. People say low back, people say hips, and, but the koshi has a, an emotional, an energetic, and a structural. So that is what really set me on a pathway to look at mind body in terms of structural work. And I was involved with a number of different acupuncturists. Because as an anthropologist, I was really interested as what do not only Japanese culture, but the senior kendo world, how do they teach and understand body mind in terms of the actual actions? So so that really and I'm sorry to cut you off, Jeffrey, it really makes sense because I've I've been in contact with you for so long that I never really understood how your particular method, which I'm sure we'll get into of Koshi balancing, came into your, you know, into your mind frame and how you got introduced to it all and how you you always told me over so many years of us knowing each other. And just to let you all know a little backstory, I actually met Jeffrey because I started volunteering on the In Touch Japan seminar that Jeffrey helped start and continue and that I'm now continuing in Japan. And then I came to, no, no, I came to the States first to your clinic. And I observed with you, I think, and then maybe on the intuition, I can't remember, but it's been a long road. And you've always told me that you consider yourself more, more of a manual practitioner than an acupuncturist. And it just makes so much sense listening to that, how, first of all, Seitai, which is very much a manual practice, how that, that and the kendo all kind of came together to give you more of a manual view of the body and view of healing before you even got into acupuncture. But it also makes sense too how you drifted into Japanese style acupuncture rather than staying more in the Chinese, because really Japan was your true first introduction to the world of healing. Is that correct? 
That's very true. Yeah, very true. And so then what happened in the sense that when I left Japan and came back to finish my uh, doctorate in anthropology from the University of Washington, I was in the library and off a lot, a lot of study. And I had this chronic neck and shoulder headaches, being too studious. And but I also got involved with Ralphing at that time, 1978. And then at the same time, Feldenkrais work. So again, these manual energetic forms of, of movement, that really influenced what I was interested in. Finished the work, went back to Hawaii, where I am again now, 25 years later. And I had a colleague who was a Japanese woman that was in Hawaii. We had started studying together wherever we can, could. And she then went to New England School of Acupuncture because of Kiko Matsumoto. Kiko said, what are you doing here? Go back to Japan. So she went back to Japan and she came back to Hawaii and she found, oh, the state of acupuncture in, in America is really deficient. Mm -hmm. And she said, let's start bringing over master teacher. And actually, I was really lucky because, and this probably relates to you, Maya, as well, being a woman in the patriarchal dominated acupuncture world or Japanese culture is very stressful. Mm -hmm. So my my dear friend and colleague, Chieko Mayakawa, said, I'm going to make you the head of the traditional acupuncture association of Hawaii. And when the, when the, when the sensei come and you greet them and you've got the credit card and you take the, the dinner, they'll think you're the boss. That was her beard. <laughs> And so we worked really wonderfully together for about 10 years. And uh, she studied with this teacher who was a structural acupuncturist. And he called his system Sei Tai Shim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Organizing, say, to organize, to regulate structurally that which the body with acupuncture. And he had been very influenced by, <clears throat> by So Tai. By Hashimoto Sensei Sotai. So that was my introduction there again of how I integrate movement with structure with acupuncture. And then with Chieko, we brought over Shudo Sensei, Ikeda Sensei, uh, Junji Mizutani, uh, Sodimachi Sensei came maybe six or seven times. So that was the, the real deepening for me into structural, the structural energetic aspects of acupuncture by having those connections, the teachers. And, and then personally, what also happened, I realized, oh, here I am doing all of this in Japan, but the motherland is China. You have to make a pilgrimage somehow through back to there. And I was working with a, a Chinese national who was the head of the uh, Reproductive Center at University of Hawaii. And in her later years, she had gotten interested in acupuncture. She was a medical doctor, OBGYN. And she said, I've got a great person for you in, in Hong Kong, a wonderful acupuncturist. Go and study with him. So he accepted me, Gary Butt, the traditional Macau herbal acupuncture family. What was unusual about Gary was he had gone to England and become a physical therapist, even though he was trained traditionally. So again, he had a more physical, structural orientation. And the other aspect was he had a lot of expat foreigners living in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And the majority of them found that the traditional needling techniques used by the Chinese acupuncturists were too strong and they didn't like it. So he went to Japan and <laughs> studied with Manaka Sensei Very to learn some basics and more gentle approaches. And it's really funny when I look back. So this was 1980, I was working in Hong Kong. 
And they didn't have guide tubes. They didn't have shinkan. So he would take little aluminum tubes and we'd cut them on a hacksaw and make our own guide tubes. You didn't just go pick some bamboo. It would have been so much better. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm interested, Jeffrey, because just because I know your backstory, I can ask you these questions. But I think you've left out two really important things from your, your origin story, so to speak. One, you're kind of an amazing dancer. And, and I've heard this from many people. And I know that you really love dancing. And like, you know, even when you said you hurt your knee, that started with dancing. So how did dancing continue throughout this story and drive your education, so to speak? And how is it continuing? And then at the same time, I think we should mention that you're one of the quote unquote, founders of acupuncture of the United States. Is that correct? Like you were grandfathered into the licensureship and you never had to go to a traditional acupuncture school. That's right. No, that, no not true. Oh, I thought you were grandfathered in. No, they didn't grandfather anyone. In. Yeah. No, the, I think the earliest state was Nevada. There was a Chinese doctor who started. That was the first state to get licensed. Then Hawaii because of uh, that large Asian population there. And then gradually it spreads. No, there was no, no grandfathering. I went to a very poor school, which doesn't exist anymore in Hawaii. Okay. For some reason, I thought you, had, you didn't have to go to, to acupuncture school because of your education, but... Uh, there was, no, there, it's true. There was still a, a period where you could get your license through apprenticeship. That's okay. right. And I was in the middle of that, and it was falling apart nationally as an, an approved pathway. So I took this other course. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so how does dancing yes. okay. come into this? And then I do want to get back to China. But, you know, usually when I talk to acupuncturists, my very first question is, well, how did you, you know, how did you get into Japanese acupuncture? And you've definitely told us that. And then how did it change your practice? But I don't think... Japanese acupuncture changed your practice. It sounds like it was your practice. And then you had this, what well, well, I'm hopefully we'll get into this influence from China afterwards, right? Yeah. Yeah. So a couple of different threads here. I had never been a, a dancer. And uh, I think I got into dance through kendo. Really? Yeah, through the engagement of what in Japanese we would call the ma'ai, the, the interval of engagement. Are you close? Are you far? How do you feel connected through the empty space? Mm. The ma'ai. So that was a profound somatic orientation that I learned from the martial arts. That then when I started to become interested in dance, was already right there. The ready was a spatial engagement even before you held or touched or contacted the other person and then what happened yes so then living in boulder i'd become very interested in the work of bonnie bainbridge cohen i don't know if you know her work i don't i don't another brilliant uh, physical therapist and bonnie was an aikido practitioner and she developed a a, a kind of a body awareness work, awareness through a movement. And she's well worth reading her work and seeing her videos. Incredible. So there was a woman teaching principles of body awareness through a movement, and, but she was doing it through contact improvisation, which mm -hmm. is a postmodern dance form developed, comes out of the Aikido tradition. And it was, how do you make contact with the other person? Where is your ground? How much can you feel into the other person of where their ground is or isn't in, in the sense of that martial arts engagement? And all of a sudden, as I was doing and studying acupuncture, I said, just fits together. I, I want to be able to feel into just what I touch. What's the quality? So... That, that's how that part of the dance work. And, you know, it's funny you say that just not, no joke, just yesterday, I was teaching at CSTCM, a pediatrics class, and one of the students asked me, 
Well, when you palpate, because pediatrics and shonishin, the basis of Japanese acupuncture itself, you said this, the basis is palpation, how you touch and feel and understand. And I was like, well, you have to be able to palpate in a way that you don't influence, but you can also understand and start to diagnose. And then when you start to needle, you have to be able to feel through the needle and feel the person's other space and be able to not only with your hands, but with the tools, be able to, how do they, how do you say that? To match your key to, to mm-hmm. match, and the key of each individual organism, how your key reacts to theirs and what is going on with their key. You need to be able to read that. And I think it's kind of, it's really cool that you found that again with this Japanese base to it, not only mm-hmm. through your martial arts, but your acupuncture study and then Seitai and then also with dance and it and it was all kind of by chance it it sounds like too right if you believe in chance <laughs> but that's that's so serendipitous and amazing and gosh I just wish you could teach that to every single acupuncturist their first day at school would you would you do that for me <laughs> like everyone needs to learn that lesson what an important lesson to learn well, it's clear, I think, for me that the Chinese styles, although I, I totally believe that there are senior Chinese style practitioners that feel all that stuff. But generally, the, the main emphasis is, can you elicit a Dutchy response? And they figure that is all that's needed. Matter of fact, I was on the doctoral committee of a student Kato Sensei's from PCOM, and the, her research, Elizabeth Talcott, who still teaches at PCOM in San Diego, I think, mm-hmm. showed that the, the Chinese approach did not have yin supportive needle techniques. All the, they're using heavy gauge needles with strong insertion and strong stimulation that you couldn't support deficiency to move the qi too much. And I think so many of us had our own experience. When I trained in China, there's, I'll get back to that too, is that you give a person a treatment and then they said, John, I was wiped out for several days later. I was exhausted. Why? Because I didn't have enough resource to have that much qi moved with the strong needle techniques. I mean, 100%. And I mean, you know, I teach acupuncturists on Shinkyu worldwide. And I think worldwide, from what I hear students from Israel to India to the UK to the US, they all tell me of this experience that, you know, I get treatment in the clinic at, at school and I get wiped out or I keep my treatment is so strong. I want to be able to be more, be able to adapt more to children or people with lower immune systems or the elderly population. Mm-hmm. Well, this so many people in the population and it and they, they don't understand why they're gravitating towards the Japanese style. But I think that's a really great way to put it, that the Japanese, how did you say it, that the, the gauge of needle and the technique is supporting the yen. Is that, is that correct? That's right. Yes, very definitely. But even when I look at the, one of my main teachers, Shoot Den Masons, and you look at his books, his first books that were translated into English, he was doing insertions or to 30 to 40 millimeters. Very deep. deep. You know, more Chinese style. And then what he found in the modern culture, people had more and more deficiencies. And the deficiencies had to be treated more gently and more superficially. And his needle penetration and needle techniques became more and more superficial, more and more delicate, working on the nervous system rather than the muscular system. So for me, when you look at the um, neuroembryology of the body between the ectoderm and the mesoderm, well, the mesoderm is where the muscle and connective tissue are, but the brain and the nervous system are related to the skin. So skin stimulation, particularly among the Japanese, has become more and more important and as people become more and more deficient through electronic overstimulation and fast foods and insomnia, that 
it's entirely different. I think that modern TCM that we all have learned uh, developed in response to the modern, modernization in China in the 1950s and 60s, where their acupuncture was really developed for agricultural laborers, hard bodied factory workers, and more muscular issues and big, strong, heavy stimulations. Whereas the kind of postmodern urban development that Japan did 30 years or 40 years before China is mm-hmm. very, very relevant for China. Today, <clears throat> we're dealing with weaker bodies, not hard body bodies. And needed more gentle stimulus. And in part, that also became very amplified in Japan by you know, the devastation after World War II, mm-hmm. where there were far more deficiencies of food and housing and the, the cultural uh, loss of uh, a militaristic orientation of society. So that even in Shudo Sensor's work, you can track his evolution. So now he does his SRT, which is essentially a, a one or a one millimeter or contact needling surface uh, uh, type of thing. And all of these things exist in traditional Chinese medicine. Yeah, and they're all like classical needles. Exactly. When you look at Ling Shu One and the nine classic needles, three of them are not inserted. So. Uh, That'll get me back to Wang Junyi in just a moment and, and channel palpation. I love that you brought, brought up, though, just to say, I really love that you just brought up the the layers of, you know, the zygote when it splits into the three different layers, because that is literally one of my explanations for why Shonishin is so much more effective for pediatrics than insertive needling. Because mm-hmm. they are their nervous system to keep them alive. And so therefore we need to treat the nervous system. We need to treat the outer layers of the skin to really treat them as individuals and as beings. Um, so I just, I want to say that I love that you brought that up. So happy about that. Um, yeah. And it's, you, I think you're hundred percent correct that, you know, despite the contact needling has been around for a long time in Japan, more and more. And all of my teachers have told me this more and more. The populations of the world are becoming very sensitive and very deficient and very overworked. Um, yeah. Sitting in desks in front of a Zoom call meeting, you know, like this is what the world is now. And to be able to treat those individuals, we need to be able to have the techniques and tools that can treat them for where they're at. And that right. is more superficial, gentler palpation, more structural understanding the whole system rather than one point stimulation. Exactly. So that brings me back to my good fortune. I've been very lucky. You have been. <laughs> whether, whether you call it serendipitous or whether there's some kind of karmic good fortune that I, I haven't deserved, but I received was that uh, my, my Hong Kong teacher, Gary Bott, this is on 1980, goes to some big meeting in Shenzhen in the People's Republic and uh, he had, a, he had a group of about five or six foreigners like me, and he connected with, with the Beijing Municipal Hospital people, and they said, oh, we want to have a program too, not just Nanjing, and not, there are a couple of places that were accepting foreigners. And so he got us into, this is 1981, into the very first group to study at the Beijing Municipal Hospital, and, that, and the teacher was Wang Ju. So if people don't know his book, I think it's the most profound book on Chinese medicine written in, for acupuncture, uh, applied channel theory in Chinese medicine. Okay. And uh, what Wang Junyi found was that uh, palpation key and channel palpation. So, so many people just get hung up on points. And, and for modern, a lot of modern acupuncturists, the channels are irrelevant. You're really teaching, treating coin. And that's so incorrect, isn't it? Yeah. So incorrect. At the very, I, I tell this to my students all the time. My first introduction to the meridians was an entire year-long course where we only palpated the meridians. That's so, how it should be. I believe when you said, how can we teach beginning acupuncture students? They should be learning 
some form of cranial sacral or shiatsu palpatory awareness first. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, and it's just so foundationally important. I mean, coming back again to how you were talking about the dance and also Pendle, you know, the Ma'ai and coming together and the greeting and then the reading of each other's key and then how that your key intermeshes. And then being able to read, of course, with kendo, it's a martial art. So being able to read how the key is moving and how you're going to balance and interact with it. But that's the same with the body. That's the same. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, and I think perhaps that's one of the reasons why just from such an early stage, Jeffrey, I absolutely loved you. <laughs> because I was like, you know, hey, finally an American acupuncturist who understands <laughs> what I'm talking about. You know, and it's just really great. But I think. Quite recently, though, weren't you able to make, weren't you able to, like, treat Wang Jui when you oh went? Oh, my God. Like, yes. Yeah. Did oh my you goodness. tell me that experience? Yeah. So, Beijing University of TCM, kind of the Harvard of Chinese medicine. Well, before that, Wang Jui decided to have his first international acupuncture seminar. He'd been teaching wonderful, wonderful people. As, as China opened up more, he was able to develop more of his own personal theories about channel palpation. And, and this, rather than keeping, when I studied with him, he was kind of constrained to code the QTM line, right? So I was his really first foreign student, first foreign student group. So in the previous 20 years, he had developed quite a coterie of people like Jason Robinson and Jonathan Chang and a number of different teachers. And so they, he invited me to come to his first presentation in Beijing. And I chose to write about the Tai Yin level, six levels. Why? Because Tai Yin represents the lung and the spleen, which the lung governs the skin, and the spleen governs the next layer of the connective tissue subcutaneous. This tissue where all the capillary beds are, the chi and blood level. And so I took that point as this was really to me what the Japanese focused in on rather than the deeper levels of stimulation of what's happening there at the chi level on the skin and the circulatory nutritive layer being wow. uh, below. I think they found that very interesting, you know, but didn't fit really into the GCM category. But the following year, the Beijing invited me back to talk about technique. They had a whole big seminar on technique. So I went to Ling Shu and used the example of the Taishin. It was something which was part of their fundamental medicine, which they've lost. And the Japan has, Japan has revived. And uh, with my work in, in Japan, with Stephen Brown and the InTouch acupuncture and box combustion work, we had run into Funamisu Takahiro Sensei. And he uh, was probably one of the great inventors or developers of patient therapy. And uh, right after a great Kanto earthquake of 2013, the Fukushima nuclear disaster, I had been studying with a sensei from Sendai, which is kind of right by the epicenter of all that devastation. And uh, many thousands of people were living in refugee centers and reconverted trailers and stuff like that. And even with Funamisu, who went up there, found that even the most gentle, superficial white acupuncture for many of these, these refugees was too much. They had too much discoordination, fear and anxiety. And he started finding he would get better results just with skin stimulation using the tissue. Yeah. So there was, I, sorry to cut you off. There was someone else God, God. Yeah. who also went up there and he reported back because he runs a disaster relief acupuncture NPO in Japan from Yashinomichi, and he also came back with the report saying that really treating the survivors was treating the very difficult category of neither. So the inner, outer, and neither categories of disease, inner being what you do to your body, 
food, eating, sleep, and all that outer, you get hit by a car, the neither is the mental. And he said, you know, everything that I treated up there, probably 99% was of the neither category, it was all the mental. And those, even according to the classics, those are the most difficult things to treat out of all the categories because it's so sensitive. The key is so on the surface. You are treating the stimulus of the nervous system, you know, and in a hundred percent, you know, it's not yeah. muscle structure at that point. So exactly. So that was a very profound experience for me. It brought me to more and more gentle and superficial ways of stimulus. So I'm just yet, yet another thread here. Yeah. My daughter when she was two before she married, so she married, had gotten a new ID and would develop some very strong cramping as a result. And I would treat her and I could get rid of the cramping. But it only got for two or three days to come back. And I treated her several times like that. And uh, inadequate use. They were like, initially good, but they never stayed. So I didn't know what to do. So I was working very closely to Chase, another brilliant acupuncturist who was very influenced by the Toyohari superficial techniques. But his wife, Monica, was a, an osteopathic physical therapist who had done an extreme amount of work with uh, visceral manipulation, with upledger's cranial sacral. So I sent my daughter to Monica. And in two sessions, Monica cleared the issue. And I, and I said, how did you do it? What did you do? She said, well, yeah, her fallopian tube was twisted. So I, I untwisted it. What? <laughs> I didn't even know you could palpate the fallopian tube, much less figure out how it's twisted in what direction and where and untwisted. And so that led me to, for the last maybe 12 years, to study visceral manipulation and osteopathic work, which I found so profound integrated to channel palpation, which happened with battles of palpation, with more specificity, with more direct reference to specific anatomical structures. Mm -hmm. So it helps go ahead. Koshi balancing then, your Koshi balancing is really that, because Koshi balancing, for those of you who don't know, because we haven't really gotten to that in this whole discussion. Your history is so profoundly interesting. But the Koshi balancing is kind of your creation of style and technique and approach to the body, if I could say so. So within Koshi balancing, you have the integration of meridian palpation and then also of the visceral manipulation work. Is it the combination of just those two, or is there something no. <laughs> put into that mix? So tight, therapy, of course, uh, the mock combustion, and and two, as well, so, and and, uh, and the same time, general work in the universities, which is involved in working acupuncture points while we're having the body. So, for example, if I had a pelvic issue, a restriction, and I know that the pelvis is really tipped forward, so I'm kind of a hyper dosis in the back. Many acupuncturists will just treat the back. So, so we were talking about Hoshi balancing and how, how and what you're utilizing to combine and create your unique style of acupuncture. Yeah. So... Uh, for example, my conclusion is that acupuncture is a manual medicine. And I think not enough acupuncturists recognize that. And in part, I think that also due to Chinese cultural value, that if we look at the spectrum of therapies, the highest, most regarded are the herbalists, the ones who don't touch the body. Touching the body is lower class. They only touch the radial pulse. Mm -hmm. The next layer would be acupuncturists, which have to touch the body to find the points. The lowest level is the twina, the body work. So there is that kind of cultural unwillingness 
to really touch the other person. And, and in Japan, I think that was very different. A number of reasons. One, I, I think it has to do things. So I'm, I'm going way off the deep end here. I think one reason has to do with Japanese bathing practice. When you go to the Shinto and you're what, you know, what they call me no uchi, me, was in the hands is where the essence is. You said family members, mothers, your fathers with their kids will really feel the body as they're scrubbing and cleaning. There's a lot of surface contact and feeling the quality of the skin. Is it rough? Is it smooth? Is it cold? Is it warm? So there's an appreciation of tactile appreciation of the level of key that's felt by touch through the bathing practices. And that friends, if you're a certain degree of friendship, then you can scrub your friends back. So that has to do with a certain kind of intimacy of being able to touch. And the other aspect of that is related, but it has to do with onsen culture where you're wearing a yukata robe, your abdomen is always easily exposed. And because Japanese cultural ideas about the, the importance of the hara, of the abdomen, of being a spiritual center, an emotional center, digestive center, that fukushin, abdominal diagnosis and abdominal massage is deeply embedded into Japanese culture. Deeply deep. Right. Well, and, and even if you study kimono, which I haven't in, in detail, but I went to school with a, a lovely lady who lived in Kyoto for several years and got very high level in her kimono classes. Kimono is kind of like kendo or aikido where it has bevels. And one of the things that she taught me was that within the kimono, how you wear the kimono, where you wear the kimono is extremely integrated into acupuncture and the idea of health within acupuncture. So for example, you always have your ankles covered when you're wearing your kimono, unless it's midsummer. And although you don't wear tights under a kimono like we would in a dress in Western culture, because you have the obi, which is the outside belt of the kimono, but also the inside. So underneath your kimono, the women would wrap essentially like a sheet around their belly many times because they needed to protect their belly. Yeah, and by, yeah. Yeah, by doing that, you never get cold. It's actually kind of brilliant. That's not only the brain, it's not only uh, the kimono, the hadamachi. Mm -hmm. That the actual pure kalil is used by laborers in the wintertime. These guys doing construction. I'm like, I'm oh, sorry, sure. uh, where are the hadamachi? You keep their yeah. that core warm. You can, you can get a haramaki at any department store. And so for those of you who are like, what in the world a haramaki is, essentially, if you can take, take like a tank top and you would cut the tank top off below the bra line. So it would just cover from maybe like mid drift, maybe like your diaphragm down to below your hip bones. And so that essentially is all a hadamaki is now. If you go to a department store, any a department store, you can get ones that are fuzzy and ones that are thin or ones that are silk. And I, I would say at least half of the population of Japan wears a hadamaki under their clothes. I know I did when I lived in Japan. I don't wear it anymore simply because we don't sell them in the U.S. So I just wear an undershirt. But this idea of keeping your stomach warm is so integrally interwoven into society and then you know it's funny when you getting back to the palpation you you mentioned onsen culture and bathing culture but you didn't mention blind acupuncturists so why why leave that out yeah. <laughs> i guess because we're so foundation the origins of japanese style of architecture the sugiyama white the right. founder who became blind while he was practicing acupuncture to develop the guide to the Shinkansen, Shinkan. And actually, a lot of people don't realize because the, the guide to was now the international standard of acupuncture everywhere. But it wasn't. Them. Yeah, but it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, but people don't realize. I just think you the, the tip of the, the handle of the needle protrudes about three or four millimeters above the guide tube and just 
lock it down. People don't realize this was a measurement guide for blind acupuncturists who couldn't see how deep the needle was going, that whether you just tap it um, so you're on the surface or you're one millimeter or you're three millimeters down, it's, it's a very clear measurement of depth that developed out of the use of using the guide to. Yeah, so again, my school was, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation that I actually went into on another interview with an acupuncturist here from the States. But, you know, really getting, you know, we've talked so much about your history, Jeffrey, and your history. I think I could do three or four interviews with you and still not cover all of the amazing situations that you have found yourself in along the road and the path that you've taken to get where you're at in your career. But I think my biggest question for you would be, if you were to meet, and I know both of us meet a lot of students a lot of the time because a lot of people search you out to be a mentor, just like they do with me and Shinkyu. But if you were to meet someone on the street who says, I'm an acupuncturist and I want to study Japanese acupuncture, or I've started to study Japanese acupuncture, let's say a little bit, one or two classes at school, and I really want to go deeper, what would be your biggest pieces of advice based on all of these phenomenal experiences that you've had? Yeah, good question. I, I think I would encourage them to get deeper into palpatory therapy so that their hands are more intelligent. When well, I think about the years that I studied shiatsu, for example, and even acupuncture, where people are primarily looking for where is the restriction? Where is the hardness? Where is the tenderness? Those are easier to find. For sure. But, but in a way, the deeper idea that I think maybe some of the Japanese are taking from the Nam Jin classic of difficulties, chapter 69, is that yin tends towards deficiency, yang tends towards excess. So feeling for a deficiency is a very different type of sensitivity than feeling for excess. And it takes more what I would call from the, the osteopathic tradition, more listening, where you forget your treatment plan, forget your saying, oh, this is a, a liver excess plain deficiency, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get that liver excess to calm down. The first thing is just be present on the surface. And what do you feel? How do you listen to the body rather than the body having to listen to my theory about what that body needs. So it's like, how do we learn just to be present to see what the message that we're receiving rather than it's so easy for us to be into the doing first. And the doing comes from me or from the therapist thinking that you've got it. I, I know your problem. And it's just based on our own conceptual models, which are wonderful, but they may not be really the message that the person's body is giving us. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, I was talking to Erland a while back on one of these interviews, Erland Truitt, and I'll, I'll put a link for that up here somewhere. But, you know, Erland said it really well, you know, that his teacher, which is, you know, different than Shudo Sensei, but his teacher said, you know, the point in the book is good for the book. The point on the patient is good for the patient. And I think, you know, you can say that in so many different ways, but it's just so important to listen to the patient with your hands, to mm. diagnose with your hands and to hear what that patient's body needs that day and then be able to meet that with the correct techniques. And those aren't always the dispersing techniques. As you were saying, a lot of the time, it's the tie-in. A lot of mm -hmm. the time, it's these yin levels, and we need to learn how to listen to the yin. And, you know, I think in your program, at least when you were here in Colorado, you often recommended people going to visceral manipulation workshops. Right. Do you still recommend that for people to develop their hands, or is there something different that you think is more beneficial to develop this understanding and the ability to diagnose, or th I think you said think with your hands. Think with your hands, yeah. Well, I still feel that everyone who has mentored with me in Colorado, I strongly encourage them to deepen into visceral manipulation. It's very compatible with our style of acupuncture and 
our style of acupuncture still has a pre-modern, diffuse understanding of the structural anatomy of the Zong Fu. Mm -hmm. So we understand the stone. Their ancients were, were pretty good in their palpatory work, but there's been so much more. And so, for example, doing a workshop in August, Hawaii, which we call Chi Blood and Fluids, which is kind of using osteopathic principles for acupuncturists. The example that I, I like to use in this is kidney three. Well, first of all, when you look at Yuan source points, classically, they're all over major arteries. So when you think about this, this heavy-handed, thick needle, strong insertion, you can't do that on a source point. You can't do it on where that posterior tibial artery is at kidney three. So what happened at TCM, they, they changed the point to fit the needling. So that a Chinese kidney three is midway between the Achilles tendon and the radial and the artery, which is not the point at all. So for chi blood and fluids and the value for in my mind of palpatory precision is that what's the quality of the artery at kidney three? How mushy is it? How hard is it? How sunken is it? Where is the artery? But is it the art arterial issue or is it a, a chi issue? What, what's the quality of the nerve that passes? They're all bundled together, right? So it, is, the, is it very nervy? Is the nerve hard? Does it have the ability to lengthen and move? Or is there the fluids? Is, is it the limp? Is the ankle swollen because there's not enough uplift that's happening to move the fluid? So depending on the specificity of palpatory clarity, whether I want to use a needle, whether I want to use a moxa, or whether I want to do something else. So I love that. And then what I'd love to do then is I'll go ahead and link to that workshop in the description below. And then that's just for this August. So if anybody who's mm -hmm. watching this video and it's past August because of YouTube's wonderful algorithm, I'll go ahead and link also to Jeffrey Dan and how to get a hold of him, how to get a hold of future teachings. Because I think Jeffrey, through Koshi Balancing and what I've seen from your continual offerings, your so generous offerings, is that you continue to teach how to touch the body, how to palpate, how to decide on which tool to use, of course, according to you and your style, but I really do think that you offer some pretty invaluable classes and things that everybody at one point needs to start developing their palpation. In Shinkyu, that's the first thing that I, that I teach in Shinkyu is that you have to learn how to palpate the meridians and where they actually are and understand them as these highways and rather than these specific straight lines that you can snap a line onto the body and it's just there. That's not how the, the body works. So yeah, that'll all be in the description box below. And, and just to sum this all up, Jeffrey, do you have any parting words for the acupuncturists and the practitioners and students who are listening? Well, I want to encourage people to sensitively palpate more. For example, a very simple example of lateral epicondylitis. Okay. Someone is a carpenter and using a hammer, and another person's a tennis player, and the third person is a cello player. Now, they can all have lateral epicondylitis, but their large intestine 11, their large intestine 10, are not going to be the same. What the Japanese call the currently alive point for that person has to be felt and palpated. So just taking it like, like you, Erwin's teacher of Kohara, Kohara Sensei said, it's not just a matter of saying that large intestine lavender, there's so many sun below the radial mm -hmm. at the condyle, it's like you have to find it on the person. So the metaphor that I like in, in there is that I can have a map, a street map, I can find your house. That's using a chart, but I want to be able to open your front door. I want the key to your door. And that happens through the palpation. So Yeah, and I love the way I love the way you put that, that the acupuncture points are just the address, you know? They're the GPS right. coordinates. 
but you have to be able to find the exact door of the house and the and the address doesn't give that to you and that's just yeah i love that so all right so thank you so much everyone for listening to this conversation with jeffrey dan he is an amazing acupuncturist healer friend mentor all around human being and i think everyone in their lifetime if they can should go and take a class with jeffrey he's absolutely amazing so thank you jeffrey so much for taking your time today in beautiful hawaii and um, <laughs> talking with me it's been so long since i've been able to see your smiling face so it, yeah it's been a while and we n never got even to say a word about koshi balance and ah uh, well i think <laughs> i think we should schedule another time and just talk about koshi balancing and what it is because yeah. your history in itself is so fascinating and something that very few practitioners have the ability to do you know and then understanding your whole history and how that created koshi balancing is just going to be that much interesting mm -hmm. that, that much more interesting so if you're willing to i would love to do another conversation yeah that'd be really great good fun with you <laughs>